Okay. Um, so let's get started. Uh, thank you for coming for this um, welcome session to our new SeaWorld transfer student. Um, so my name is Denling Zhang. I'm a professor of finance and associate dean of research and faculty development in the College of Business. In addition, I co-direct a center called the Center of Entrepreneurial Finance and also a lab called Blockchain Business Lab in the College of Business. Um, I will be sharing some uh, information about my research platforms, which is the center and the lab with you later. Okay, so um, before I share uh, tips or uh, resources on campus uh, with you, I would like to ask you some questions. So, so sort of to uh, motivate the conversation in the next slide. Um, so the first, first question I have for you is, why do you want a college degree? Second question, so why do you want to transfer to Stanford from other universities? We have huge value, right? Relative to the tuition we charge and the Stony Brook degree offers tremendous value. It comes with a lot of skills and also a wonderful environment, which is something I want to share with you. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. Now I'm going to share my thoughts, right? So, so this is my personal opinion. Um, I think about this, what would be after you, you come to college, uh, college for your education. So what you're doing essentially under my uh, language, I'm a professor in finance, I study investments. So college education is the biggest investment you do in your life. One of them, if not the biggest, it's one of the biggest. So basically the college ed education is a process you invest in your human capital. You hope to uh, improve the value of your human capital in order to have a better dividend, which is your labor income down the road. Are you with me? Okay. So because you're making the investment, you put in something, you hope to get something. What is that hope, right? What is the ideal output of this whole investment process? At the end of the college education, you, you will get a degree, but what else that comes with the degree that really makes a difference in your life, right? So that's something we think, we need to think about the, the time we make the investment so that we can make, uh, take advantage of all the resources, all the opportunities in order to achieve that ideal and outcome. So the goal here, which we all agree, is we want to be career ready by the time we get our degree. It's beyond the degree. It's the skills, it's the, the network, it's everything that comes with the degree that, that's going beyond the degree so that you can be career ready, right? So think about what do we mean by career ready? In this world nowadays, my understanding of being career ready is multifaceted. There are a number of elements that go into this career ready statement. The first statement, which is gonna surprise a lot of people, but I think it's very true nowadays. Maybe in 20, 20 years ago, when I graduated, it's not the case, but now I think it is the, the case. So first of all, if you wanna be career ready, you need to have a target career market. So you need to be a niche expert. You need to know something, simple or hard or difficult or, or, or it's, it's mainstream, non-mainstream, something, some little thing, right? That you are better than most people. You know a lot. It's like your hobby, your, your, your passion, something you really know it inside out and out. Uh, so you need to have the deep knowledge and solid skills on the, on the niche field. It could be a subfield, it could be a topic, it's something you're really good at. That's better than most other people. Okay. Number two, um, you should have general field knowledge that comes with your degree once you pass all the courses, especially if you pass them with A, A minus and so on and so forth. You have a good uh, idea of the general uh, field knowledge and the framework and you can go become a lifelong learner to educate yourself afterwards. Third of all, uh, everybody in the college business, when you graduate, you should have strong communication and people skills. 
and not just just general skills in any setting, but in professional setting, right? Which means that when you go to classes, work with your teammates, you should treat every occasion as professional setting. Develop your professional um, uh, sense, right? Professional training or through those occasions and be a professional person, right? Meaning that you should not be late. You should dress your professor, professor or doctor or mister, whatever. And you should uh, respect your teammates. You should put on your fair amount of work, if not more than your fair share, in order to be a valuable colleague contributing to a project. And those things we call professionalism. And you should start doing that on day one. And unfortunately, some people fail to do it, even they got a degree, which means they're not career ready. The next one is starting from today, or maybe even before you come uh, transfer to Stony Brook, you have started to build your professional network. And you will grow your professional network here to be part of the Stony Brook community and to find people you can partner with, you can learn from in your life. That's very important, okay. Next one, this is something a lot of people didn't realize. And recently um, I invited many speakers to my classroom We realized this is actually very important, which is college business students, doesn't matter which major you have, every one of us, every one of you, should have a good sense of what's going on in the world and on the market. Market meaning financial market or product market, business market, anything, right? And because people who, have, who are not informed what's going on around them and on this competitive world, they're not clear already. Nowadays, interviews at the top level and the last interview is what's going on today? That's the question. And what's going on? You have to know the geopolitical risk. You have to know the Federal Reserve policy. You have to know the recession odds, the labor market, the product market, a big tech laying off people. What's the implication for company and for uh, for uh, for for uh, every individual, right? And those is what they call the sense of market sense of the, the world. And lastly, is something, it doesn't matter if it's college business or college engineering, every single school, every single discipline in this university and beyond is looking to train our students to have wisdom. So what is wisdom? Wisdom is to put all the information, all the knowledge together and to inform your judgment to inform your decision-making process. So you make sensible and sound decision. So all your education should make you be a more, a, a smarter person who makes better decisions, using better information, know how to put the information together, solving problems, right? If you can't do any of this, you can know all the knowledge in Wikipedia, it doesn't help you, right? All the, all the data, all the knowledge you, you gather, are, you to, are, you, are to inform your decision making. That's it, right? That's what business education is about. Okay, so what are the essential skills to be career ready? So I'll tell you what those are skills, in my opinion, I'll tell you where to get them. So the first one is communications and teamwork skills. And you can do that every day. You can go to your project, uh, class project, you participate in the class, do your teamwork, do research with faculty, you can acquire those skills. All curriculum are built to help you to, to acquire those skills. Quantitative skills, um, especially in my field of finance, quantitative skill is very important. A student can learn from different courses, they can learn um, uh, young classroom by themselves, and also they can um, do project, uh, in classes or in research projects in order to apply those uh, skills. The third one is networking skill, right? People skill, communication skill. You will have a lot of opportunities to do this, like team projects. There will be a lot of networking events on campus and in the college business. And then also you can do internships, you can do uh, various projects in order to 
uh, enhance your networking skills. So those are the three I think you can acquire on the typical curriculum uh, in the college of business for a lot of activities, right? Through a lot of activities. However, the last one, which is how you can become a niche expert, I would say the general courses are not designed to train everybody to be a niche expert because you have to teach the entire class. You're not you are not teaching one individual, right? So the the curriculum is designed to give you the general knowledge, general field knowledge. If you want to be a niche uh, expert, you have to take um, courses that's designed to be individual, uh, individual based. Uh, which I'm going to mention those courses. And you can also do research project either through the courses or through uh, other centers or labs or other opportunities. And you have to learn tremendous amount of knowledge yourself, right? So again, if you, you have a hobby, you'll probably spend 10, 20 hours a week trying to dig into it. And that's what you need to treat uh, this element of your skill. And Stony Brook University uh, provides you a lot of opportunities to acquire at least the, all of those skills, right? First of all, we are the SUNY flagship university. We are now our, our one institution, uh, which means that the university uh, meets a high standard, the, probably the one of the highest standard uh, for research intensive institution, where one of the 66 uh, research uh, intensive universities in the AAU, which is the invitation only association uh, that has all the big names, the Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Chicago, and so on and so forth. And we have world-class faculty that have uh, ongoing frontier research programs. And that's our, what our universities offer. In the college business, we are ACSB accredited. And which means uh, we're one of the 6% um, of the, the business uh, institution that offer business courses in the whole world that has been accredited. And um, we have a lot of faculty, most of them have PhDs and there are uh, many of them are from renowned universities and programs, right? Um, but knowing uh, people are doing research here without knowing what kind of research they do without being part of that, you are not taking the best advantage uh, of this money. Right? So this is something I want to spend time on. How do you take advantage of the research environment here uh, to build your skill set? Right? So there are many benefits for research experiences because you can apply your knowledge, you can learn how to solve complicated problems or problems. Typically research means that you do something people don't have a consensus answer on, right? It's something you have to figure out. And also you, through research, you can find uh, your niche, your true passion, you develop your career girl, goal. And also you can network with your peer student professor, maybe practitioners, companies, and so on and so forth. When you are on the job interview, people say, tell me your story. You have a unique story to share, right? And you say, oh, I take this course. Everybody is taking that course. So why do I have to hire you as opposed to Mr. Smith, right? So on. So research for research um, in the college of business, you can take uh, many courses, right? And for instance, um, maybe most of you are graduate, undergraduate students. So I'm gonna skip the graduate uh, courses. But uh, for the team, uh, for team research, like for instance, graduate courses or undergraduate courses, they have some uh, courses designed to ask all students to do team projects. Um, so I don't have all the courses here, but those are for graduate. For, indiv uh, for individual research, uh, undergraduate student can take, can become an honor student in the business program, and you have to do your honor service with the faculty, right? And you have to present it at the RICPA. Uh, uh, to conclude, uh, to, to complete the requirement. For students from Honors College, they do senior project with the faculty. Uh, I, uh, some of them work with uh, faculty in the college business and it's a one, one year long uh, project course. 
And for everybody, you can find a faculty and do, do research, independent research with the faculty. And for master or undergraduate levels, and you can get that individualized training um, to uh, really dig deeper on the topic and become an expert in that particular topic. Um, in addition to the sort of PhD, sort of PhD faculty research kind of program, you can also become like a teaching assistant through one of the courses, or you can also work with outside company uh, in the summer through the internship course that's sponsored by a faculty member. Um, so faculty members don't do much, but they sort of coordinate with the, the outside company uh, to make sure you have learned something uh, throughout the course. Any questions about those? Um, in terms of different research platforms in the college business, I have a list of the centers and lab in the college business. It may not be exhaustive, but it has most of them. Um, the first two are something I was involved. I am involved, uh, Center of Entrepreneurial Finance, Blockchain Business Lab. We also have Innovation Center and other centers that with different focus, typically depending on the uh, research expertise of a faculty member. So what you do is to go to our college business website and find the centers and lab and click on the, the links and go to their respective website, look at what they do, how do you apply if you're interested in that particular uh, research uh, focus. Right? And then they will have, like in my, uh, in my lab, we have bi-weekly meetings and so on and so forth. Uh, above and beyond the college business, the university level, you can also be some other programs, right? Uh, sort of develop your niche um, expertise or your, your strength. Uh, one of the programs, and recently the university, um, uh, I think the engineering school started to collaborate with the college business, is uh, belongs to this VIP program. So the VIP program is vertically integrated uh, project program, which means that you could have multiple faculty working in on the startup idea, with a tech idea, or whatever business idea together, so they can start a course. Allow anyone on campus to register. It could be a one, two, three credit course. You could be working in on the on the the project. It's more like a sort of uh, tech team. It could be tech or business team where you could have multiple faculty members, you have PhD student, master student, undergraduate student working on the same business idea, right? So the business idea can be early, it could be uh, just try to convert a, pat, a, a technology into a patent before commercialization. It could be a little bit later, that's come uh, during the process of commercialization of the technology, right? So you, you can just Google vertical integrated project and search for Different expert, different fields of students they are looking for, then you can apply, right? And that's ongoing for multiple years for each project. And some of our students, instead of uh, trying to enhance their research skills, they try to develop their niche expertise through take, getting a lot of outside professional certifications, right? For instance, in my field, many students will be interested in the CFA, the Chartered Financial Analyst Certification. Many accounting students are working on the CPA certification. Uh, in finance, uh, you can be an analyst to do the CFA. If you want to be a financial advisor, you do CFP, which is the Certified Financial Planner Certificate uh, Designation. Or if you want to be uh, a trader, you will want to be a risk manager, then you do uh, FRR, right? So there's a lot of, uh, we don't have courses here in Stony Brook for you to take, but you can take them outside. But still, you have to learn a lot and take the exams in order to be certified before you go on the job market. In addition to those formal training, and you could have more casual sort of on networking opportunity with people sharing the same interest, right? For instance, you'll find in my field, like finance society, investment club, cryptocurrency club, 
We also started Beta Alpha Psi chapter in Stony Brook, which is for finance and accounting students to network with professionals in um, um, the city or in the business world. And also we have other clubs like Women's in Business. I don't know whether they are only run by college of business students, but there could be any students in those clubs or across campus. But many of the main participants are presidents, are, many of them are college of business students. And you can be a president or a secretary, vice president. That will uh, be helpful too. Any question here? Um, in terms of finding internships and jobs, uh, definitely check out the Career Center website. And we have an online database called Handshake. Make sure you register with the Handshake. It has all the job hosting, you have to go to a Handshake. Right. Um, we also have a jobs on campus website. You can find on campus opportunities, but th those are less like the finance career or business career. It's more like the campus. Um, uh, temporary in employment, right? But there's some some students have known that also uh, graduated from college business are hired by one of the departments on campus to become administrative assistant, assistant director, things like that. That can be possible as well. I also strongly recommend everybody to develop your LinkedIn page. Do you have one? Okay, and you know, do you know how to change your LinkedIn page website? A web link into your name. Okay. So make sure you don't have those weird symbol. It, it's your name. Right? So, so the things like that, how do you structure it so it becomes attractive? You highlight your expertise so LinkedIn would promote to some job that's relevant to your expertise to you. So those are a, a lot of small little tricks you can learn from YouTube, but you've got to do it and do it. You perfect it over the years before you graduate. That you do it starting from tomorrow. And a little bit about my own research platform around the blockchain business lab, where we have faculty and students working on different research projects, uh, studying the application of blockchain technology in business with a particular focus in, um, in finance, uh, in investment and trading. Um, so we have a website now you can apply. And also we offer research awards every semester based on your contribution to the lab. Uh, the Center of Entrepreneurial Finance, we uh, connect faculty student teams with entrepreneurs to help them uh, to grow their business. Now we have less activity in recent semesters because we, we focus on getting funding for the center. Uh, but if you're interested, you can submit your application when the project is becoming available, you will be asked to, to join. The last one is Stony Thing Lab, Stony Finance Lab, stonythinglab.org, which is a community network. I started uh, myself uh, with the assistance of various student volunteers. And this website is designed to share various information and resources um, and career opportunities related to things I am interested. I am an expert by right? things like investing, behavior finance, blockchain, startup, and academic research, right? Um, so if you log into um, the website, um, yeah, stonyfinglab.org, you can register, you can uh, put your name and email to receive our weekly free newsletter that share uh, different conferences, um, maybe possibly job posting, or maybe different articles, reports. Most of them are, uh, are free, what we find on the internet, right? So some students volunteer to help me, some students I, um, I work with uh, and myself would read and uh, hear podcasts or read every day. And then I would share those good articles and good podcasts through this newsletter as well. Right. So it's, again, I am doing the same thing. Every one of us has to be a niche expert on something. That's better than any, the most people on the planet. Uh, that's how you get a career because you are better than most other people. Um, so feel free to to uh, to check in, check out our website and register for our newsletter.
So we have personal finance, behavioral finance information, investment and trading, blockchain crypto, uh, small business and startup and cognitive strategy and things that sort of I teach. And I use this website in my uh, lecture too, because a lot of research resources would be just on the website instead of having them across different courses on the, on the um, uh, Blackboard or Bright Space, I have them in one place that's open and free to everybody. Any question? Oh, it's a lot of information. <laughs> okay, uh, so I want to summarize the takeaway. Um, then after that, uh, if you are interested, you can ask me a question or I have something else to share with you that's more related to my expertise. So takeaway is, I really think Stony Brook education offers a great value to your dollar and to your time, because what you are going to get, if you know how to get the resources together to, uh, to help you pave your way to your career, and you will get tremendous value out of the, your time at Stony Brook, right? Uh, the best way to get that value, uh, I believe, in addition to take courses, getting a degree, is to take advantage of the research practice and networking opportunities on campus. And so you can grow into a career-ready person, right? So it's for conscious, right? Consciousness. The first one, consciously uh, targeting at uh, your dream job. You should start with your dream job before you start your education. Are you with me? You can say, okay, I want to go to Bridgewater, right? Ray Dalio's hedge fund. Then we go to their website saying, what do they need in order to give me a chance to interview, right? And that's your first step, <laughs> not taking a hundred courses and figure out what I want to do afterwards. But that's that one, right? You start with N, saying that's where I want to go, where, so that's, I know where, that's where I want to go, then how do I get there, right? So you start with your targets and you, then you follow by your planning. And which courses are you going to take? What kind of skill are you going to acquire? Where do you get those skills and those knowledge? And then conscious building your network because you need people referring you in, people saying good things about you, writing you a letter, right? And, uh, uh, and maybe you're building your brand and you have report putting on the website, showing people free report, right? And to demonstrate your expertise. And the last one is consciously searching because you should start searching for a job on day one um, so that you know what's the market need. Eventually, you need to be accepted and chased by the market. So you have to, uh, to know what the career, what kind of a market are, are you going to fa be facing? What's the demand and supply? How can, you give you, how can you get a competitive edge when you submit your resume? So recently, I invited a guest speaker from one of the top asset management firms. Uh, that's one of the top three or four in the in New York City, and his department manages like billions, tens of billions of dollars of assets. Then our student asked him, "Okay, so how do we get an internship in your company? Like, how do we get a job?" He said, "Better to get an internship first." But then student asked. How do I get an internship from your company? He said, typically for a thousand plus resume submitted, we take one. However, so but that's unconditional on your expertise. So general internship, it's more, more than a thousand per one plus. But if you are good at say uh, financial analysis, your odds go down to maybe. 500 or 300 to one. Right? If you say, I'm very good at credit analysis of any uh, financial reports, your odds might be 150 to one. So once you become more and more niche, and you ask for you're really, really good, and you are competing maybe just with 10, 20 people in the world. So that's the only way you can get to the top of the job because their internship will pay over 100 grand. Uh, per year, right? Annualized rate. So if you want to get those jobs, you have to be an expert yourself. It, it's not PhD, it's an expert. Everyone has to be an expert. Everyone who's successful in the real world is an expert of something, right? Okay, and think about that uh, starting from today. 
Okay. Any questions? Questions? Okay. Um, if you don't have questions, I really want to uh, give back some of the stuff I do um, uh, on Stony Brook community because I don't want to waste any chance to to help our students to be more financially uh, literate. So I'm gonna put in a couple of a few slides and here and there I do talks uh, year round, um, personal finance and investment, because I think knowing just a few slides will make you maybe financially much, much uh, savvier than the other people, right? So having all exposure, think about managing your money and will make you better off in your lifetime. Right? And those come in, uh, come, come with the free <laughs> lecture. I'm not taking extra time with yours. Um, so what is personal finance? I think every college student needs to learn this before they go to college. If they have not, they need, need to learn this during college. Because by the time you graduate from college, you go to the real world, you have to handle finances yourself. If you already make a mess on your personal finance, it's very difficult to uh, reverse that uh, path, right? So let's think about planning your personal finance um, when you are co in college and you need a roadmap for your money, right? It's the same as investing your human capital. You need a roadmap to get to where you want to be. And this is just investment in your, your money. So you need to know uh, where you, where, what's your financial goal, right? How can you get there, right? It, it's, it's all the same idea. And financial planning um, is an ongoing process because you can change your financial, adapt your financial goal over time. Maybe initially you said, I just want to be debt free by the time I graduate from college or after three years after I graduate from college. But later you say, oh, okay, I want to be financially secure. Eventually you're going to say, you know, I want to be financially free. I don't have to work for money. Right? Most of my students have that dream. They don't want to work for money. But they, before they don't want to work for money, they have to have enough money to sustain their basic lifestyle in order to have that freedom to say no to things they don't want to do. So those are very important questions to think about it. So think about your financial planning from uh, when you are a college student, it's gonna tremendously benefit you, save your years of headache down the road. Uh, what you need to do is basically concretize your financial goal, right? You can see, I wanna be debt-free three years after graduation. That's very concrete. You wanna say, well, you wanna say, I wanna be debt-free by the age of 30. Or I want to be, by the age of 35, I want to have an annual passive income of $100,000 or 45 or some people 65, it will be there. Uh, so you can set your time and you know how fast you can, you should run, right? If you set your time 30 years from now, you can take your time, right? You run very slowly, you can just walk. But if you say in 10 years, I will be there, you have to run day and night, right? It's your choice. Life is about choice and stick to, to the plan. And then figure out how much you spend, how much you save, right? Uh, you, how much loan you are gonna take, how are you gonna repay those loan? Once you have savings and it comes to my expertise, which is investments, right? How, how can you invest smartly? So your money will work for you day and night, right? Um, and lastly, and while you're building your wealth and manage your money, you don't want any house or accident things to sabotage your effort. So you want to have a downside protection, protect you against the of your day, right? That's all, all, all everything personal finance is, is all this framework. Of course, a lot of the detailed knowledge, right? So I'm gonna shift the focus, just show you a few slides about investing, because I think uh, in all of those, once you know you want to avoid uh, bad debts, you want to increase your income, uh, lower your expenditure, you're going to have savings. So the biggest task is the investing, right? You have to invest very wisely in order to have financial freedom early on in your life, not to wait until you're 75 or 85, right? Um, so uh, my, our finance students always like 35, 45, I want to be retired from my job. So I don't work for money, something like that. Um, so I find that to really a straightforward, a motivating factor once they think about when they can be financially free. 
they're all ready to work very hard now. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, investing is a, a very important component to lead to the road of financial freedom, right? So what is investing? I, I'm talk, talking about financial investing. So you are gonna give up your consumption today in order to have even higher consumption power in the future, right? It's a, it's a sacrifice to take of today in order to have a better future for yourself, right? And you want to invest uh, your access, access purchasing power today so that in the future, you have the freedom to, uh, uh, to do whatever you want because you don't worry about food and shelter, your insurance or your, your retirement, right? Because those are taken care of once you have large amount of uh, portfolio, right? You'll have passive income coming because your money is gonna be your work, your your labor, right? Working for you day and night. You sleep, they work, they produce, they, they generate uh, money for you. You you run and you have oh, a trip. You go, do whatever you want, and your your money is working for you twenty four seven, by three sixty five right day. So that's the, the goal of investing. Um, but why do we need to invest? Because because of inflation, right? Uh, we all tasted how bad inflation can, can be in eroding our purchasing power, right? For instance, I think three years ago, it was $5 to buy a, a cup of coffee, 2019, 475 or something, you know? Um, but we all know what happened in the last uh, uh, two, three, two, two years, right? And inflation is skyrocketed and Initially, we thought inflation is going to be one, two percent, two percent a year. Then three dollars, five dollars a cup of coffee in forty years. By the time you re retire from your job, you're going to pay just seven, seven fifty. It's not bad, right? However, if inflation rate is three percent, same time frame, you're going to pay sixteen dollars. It's a little we are raising eyebrow a little bit, right? So, what if it's eight percent? How much do you think you're going to pay? For, for the coffee. Can you, can you do the math in your brain? Make a guess, how much? A hundred something, very good guess. If you're gonna pay 108 for a cup of coffee, right? That's why the Fed says we have to suppress inflation by raising the interest rate because having the expectation we're gonna have 8%, 6% inflation in the next decade, people are scared, right? So every all the planning is suddenly you have to change everything you have, right? Re Replan your future. You realize I have to work for another 40 years in order to retire, right? Something like that. So the same dollar cannot buy you the same thing in the future because if the dollar bill is depreciating every day. And we're already the strongest currency in the whole world for the last 100 years. But what happened to the dollar is if you index the dollar in 1913 in terms of its purchasing power as a thousand, right, a thousand units of consumption, and today, uh, which is by the end of uh, 20, two, 2022, that a thousand units of consumption has declined to 33.7, meaning that you used to buy a thousand units of consumption, now you can only purchase with the dollar bill. 33.7 uh, units of consumption. So your purchasing power has declined by over 96%. So when people talk about millionaire back in the 19, early 1900, the millionaire at that time today, you need close to 30 millions to have the same purchasing power as a true millionaire right, in the late 1900s. So, so don't go around saying I'm a millionaire because the one million dollar nowadays doesn't get you too far. Unless you have 30 million, you can go around saying you have a million, right? Um, so this is telling you how much purchasing power can decline over a long period of time, even for the stablest, the most stable currency in the whole planet for the last hundred years, right? Not to mention uh, something like Brazil, Argentina, and uh, Venezuela, they could have 10% inflation per month, something like that, right? So in one year, I don't remember which, which country is one of the uh, World Cup. Um, is it 
I don't know if it's a trend or something. This year alone, their currency has depreciated 98 percent against dollar, something like that. It's insane. So we have to invest because investing will let us to maintain the purchasing power of the money that we have so that we can truly transport the purchasing power we save today into the future, right? We can buy the same, if not more, amount of goods and services when we need them, right? So how do you invest? So there are many, many ways, a whole multi-courses finance education, but I want to make things simple, right? Suppose you just make investment very simple, buying SP 500 ETF, uh, index investing, right? The key here I want to tell you is compound, compounding is very powerful. Being consistent, save, save uh, consistently, and you can easily become a millionaire, but the millionaire is one million nominal, right? Again, okay, not very million, right? So how do you do that, right? Um, if you start at the age of 25, you save $125 a month, which is 2% of your 75,000 annual salary, right? Shoot for that, that's, you gotta have to get 75,000, figure out how you can do it in order to get that, right? Uh, which is durable. Then you can increase your savings monthly by 0.5% because 2%, you know, uh, annualize 2% for each, uh, uh, which is 0.2, less than 0.2% each month is doable. 125 people think I can do it, right? But increase that every month by 0.5%. It's very little. You don't, you would not notice. Then you invest in your savings in the stock portfolio that earns 8% over the next. Uh, 40, 40 years, right? Um, then you'll have a million because your, mil your savings would increase from $125 to $1,400 a month, which is not a lot because by the time in 40 years down the road, you, your, your salary will be way above like multiple times of $75,000, if not more, right? And so that's again doable, but over this 40 years, you do nothing, just put in the index and just forget it. Uh, assuming uh, the index is gonna give you 8% nominal, you will have a nominal one. If you think 1 million is not enough and you want, you know, want to double that, triple that, quadruple that, then you just do the math, right? Um, so this is, it doesn't take skill. It just takes a plan and everything automatic, that's it. All you need to do is make sure you have a paycheck home. You can, you, you can stick to it, but that's it. So it doesn't take a finance major to do right? Um, a second plan is, um, is illustrated through this example, right? Suppose we have two gentlemen, Mr. Early and Mr. Late, and they have different plans to save and invest so who has gonna who is going to have more money by the age of 65? Assume 10% annual return in investment. Mr. Early started at the age of 20, say for 10 years, $150 per month. And nothing after age 30. Uh, Mr. Late starts 10 years after he started to save and invest at age of 30, and he goes on for 30 years. So by the time they retire at 65, who has more money? And so this is Mr. Early, 150 and nothing. Mr. Late, nothing, and 150 for 30 years. Okay, so who is going to have more higher nest egg by the time they retire? Uh, it turns out that Mr. Early will be a millionaire but Mr. Late will have over $600,000. So this example tells you that it's important to start early. And you can, you can save three decades of hard work by having one decade of hard work, but earlier, that's it. You just sacrifice early. You don't sacrifice more, you sacrifice less. Are you with me? So you're gonna be richer. So what you do in your 20s, basically can save your decades of work 
from the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, whatever. Right? So if you know the power of compounding, you understand investing, you understand how power accounting is gonna give you that exponent once time moves on and your biggest weapon is time. You are decades younger than us, than me, so you have a nuclear weapon because you can multiply your return ex exponent that was one plus 20 that, that I don't have. That is a lot, a lot, a lot number. <laughs> a lot of zero. Are you with me? A lot of zero, two to the power of 10. That's how many zeros? Think about that, right? Now you have 20, right? Of course, you can't double your investment year, but you you double investment every five years, which is durable. And you have four, you have two, power, two to the power of four, eight times so forever uh, having the same investment, but just 20 years left than you do. Right? That's really cool. In summary, I think I'm, uh, I'm doing every, okay. Um, you want to improve your financial literacy and financial intelligence, regardless of your major. This is not for finance students because all finance students will be trained throughout many courses on this stuff. You want to have your financial goals and plan. Uh, you really need to plan your income, spending, and increase your saving. Have a systematic approach to investing. If you persist your formula in the long term, you'll be very, very, very rich and free. That's my message. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna stop recording here. <laughs>